So fast forward, eight years later, I'm now a Buddhist bhikshu in the Chinese Chan tradition. And uh, I was on a pilgrimage that you heard just a bit about. Again, I was silent, but I was silent for six years. And every day, I was bowing to the ground for from usually from eight o'clock in the morning until five o'clock at night. And it was eight hours of moving, slow moving yoga. I was doing a full prostration, taking three steps, and then standing, doing a full prostration, three steps, and standing, etc., and going on. And this went on for two years and nine months up the Pacific Coast Highway in California. And I had abundant opportunity to interact with my monkey mind, which we're going to be hearing about in a minute. Um, because I was practicing repentance at the same time, I was repeating a verse from the Avatamsaka Sutra with each bow that atones for past evil deeds and promises to change for the good. While I bowed, again, what arose to consciousness was both startling and unexpected. In the midst of the stillness of nature, with the deep blue sea to my left and steep, uh, steep sheer cliffs to my right, the occasional seagull going by in the blue sky, I was witnessing memories from adolescence. Speaking harshly to my parents was a, a big theme of my meditation. Uh, my mother coming home as a teenager and my mother saying, do I smell cigarettes? Oh, no. <coughs> no, no cigarettes, mom. I had the pack in my back pocket, right? No cigarettes, no, no. I had experimented with tobacco and had, I, for some reason, couldn't tell the truth about it. Well, that night, flipping on my bed like a pancake, realizing that I had violated something deep inside. And bowing on the highway for all past bad karma, bowing down, suddenly being back in the state of lying to my mother with, again, the face flush and the sense of shame all intact. How unexpected. So, on one hand, you could say I was removing sensory input from my conscious mind because I wasn't reading or talking except for the Avatamsaka Sutra, but somehow I had opened a function of memory that carried data from eyes, ears, skin, and brain. How strange. So, my, after eight years of a day of moving, eight, eight hours of moving yoga a day for months, by curtailing interaction with the environment, I created a stillness. I suspect this is what's going, this is my best theory about what was going on. I created a stillness that allowed memories to arise to consciousness intact. Uh, different from the earlier experience of Zen meditation, this time after viewing them and bowing, because something about the bowing posture makes you psychically vulnerable. That's the best language I can find for it now. You are submitting, right? There you are. There's no muscle tension. You're putting your head and your heart on the same level. Now, the only time you do that during the day is at night when you're Sleeping. asleep, right? Your head and your heart are on the same level, but you're in a very different state of consciousness at that point. When you do it, when you put your head and your heart flat and you're still awake, it seems, there seems to be a cleansing function that goes on. I can't, we're, we're waiting for the data to come back before we figure out what's really happening. But there's something about, first of all, releasing the muscle memories that holds us upright and erect, all of this armor, and also putting the head and the heart on the same level that seems to have a very wholesome cleansing process. But in any case, this time, the tapes that I was experiencing seemed to have emptied themselves because once they reviewed this very humbling process of seeing all my mistakes, they didn't come back to memory later. So perhaps when you play them back a certain number of times, you erase them? I don't know what's actually happening. But what I realize, my conclusion from all of this is, if we're using the tools of Chan to unravel the mind, you don't start with the second step. What's the first step? Shila. Second step is Samadhi, meditation. Third step is Prajna. In the West, we seem to have skipped over that messy, unhappy first step and went directly to the good stuff. We wanted the meditation, right? Give me the good stuff. I'll take a six pack, you know, or give me the jumbo size. But in fact, 
if you go to that meditation step without having done the first step, guess what you meet? Everything that happened during the first step. Your character, Sheila, who I am as a person. How am I doing as a human being? That's the Sheila step. How am I living as an ethical, moral person? That's the first lesson of Chan. And you're gonna get one way or the other, whether you work on the precepts as you meditate, or if you get there through the back door and realize, oh, I didn't pay attention to who I was. I skipped over the jia and went right to the ding. Well, the hui will wait until you do the steps in order, the, the wisdom step. So, this is uh, my experience um, from, from bowing and realizing that uh, uh, the Buddha gave us Sila Samadhi Prajna, precepts, concentration, and wisdom, based on his insight of how the mind really works. And um, I think as the Dharma comes to the West, and most importantly, not only the West, as it comes to English and the scientific mind view, as it comes to our 21st century awareness of ourselves as individuated people, as beings that are somehow cut off at our skin, as people who are very much egalitarian, as women step forward into important leadership roles, at least equal roles in the Dharma, as we understand ourselves psychologically. We very much have that in the 21st century. This is a, the, the Freud and what happened in the early 19th century, in the 20th century, about understanding humanity. This is a post-Renaissance view of humanity as an individuated being, a creative individual. We really do see ourselves in psychological terms. We have this complex, we have that prejudice, we have this bias, we have this mental setup. It's very important to look at the mind using these tools of Dharma. This is how I think we have to approach. We have to take the, to what the Buddha gave us and not change it, but to deeply, deeply enter it. What does it mean? Shila, Samadhi, Prajna. Is there a significance in that order? Can it be Prajna, Samadhi, Shila? Well, they do actually make a link. The more Samadhi you have, the more wisdom arises. The more wisdom arises, the more you realize the need to perfect our humanity, to become decent, good human beings. And the more we do that, the deeper our samadhi. So there is definitely a link. And I'm suggesting that we apply these new understandings of ourselves as human beings to the ancient formulas. Look at them, chew them, make them ours. <laughs>